Ernest says, I turn my thought to joy, which I know is vibrating through all life. Through my own being and my innermost mind and heart, I reach deep into infinite being and hear the song of gladness that sings through all manifestations of life. I know that it also sings in me and as I give it expression, I am singing. I feel the energy of life and all the harmony of forms around me in tree and flower and grass, in blue sky and clouds, in the beauty of evening sunset. Wherever I look, I hear and feel the underlying joyous note that life sings and that comes to its culmination in spirit made manifest through each human being. Now, deep within my innermost being, I attune myself to the God conscious being that I truly am. I permit God's perfect idea of me to manifest, to flow forth into expression. I know that I, God's perfect expression, cannot contain grief, sadness, and harmony. I know that in my true self, I am joy, for I am God life. My life is buoyant, vivacious, sparkling, free. It contains all good. It is unity, perfection, love. And so I know that nothing can make me, the real me, sad or dejected or heavy hearted. And so it is. Ooh. And that's it. We're it, done. Except Zoom when it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting that our talk today is really about trying creating your emotional well-being and so getting on the air being reasonably frazzled <laughs> this is a better topic than i would have imagined us having because uh, when nothing works so uh, you have to go back to the prayer that things will eventually work and they still didn't work yeah i go away for nine days and i come home i worked on my computer yesterday but um this morning zoom decided to oh our camera didn't work play a little trick yeah the camera didn't work yeah. so we're on our ipad and we're happy to be with you all today. So the music we picked today, we can't play <laughs> because it's on our iPad, but so we're gonna, I'm gonna hum uh, for three minutes. So, so uh, the original, what was the original topic? <laughs> I wanted to talk about yeah. how our thoughts plus That's our it. feelings equals our demonstrations or our manifestations uh, and and, and I believe that, and I've used that in my life. And yet part of that theme kind of bothers me because the unspoken inference is, therefore only have positive feelings, what we call positive feelings, joy, happiness, you know, and, and, and that makes the, the painful ones negative. I don't like that phrase because mm -hmm. we really have to feel all of our feelings. You know, there's a saying I, I, in recovery circles: you have to to feel it to heal it. Yeah. And, you know, and yeah. if if and we don't often want to do that. And in fact, I think what we don't want to do is to use our teaching as a, as a tool for avoidance. We want to use our teaching as as a way to strengthen ourselves so that we can face the difficult times and the difficult emotions and the difficult experiences. Right. And the other the other part of that is that so often, because this teaching is so positive. We believe that when we feel or have a negative experience, not only are we at fault, but we shouldn't have that experience. And that's really a wrong. Or if we feel our feelings and they're sad, we shouldn't feel or angry that we are manifesting something bad for ourselves. You know, that's that's the um, it's a misinterpretation, but that's how that's what we can think it, it means. And so I do think that by and large, when you can have happy. Uh, constructive feelings and the thoughts and the self-talk that goes with that that helps you manifest good things in your life but that but life does contain a variety of things that are sad and painful and so to to just say well I don't want to feel that because I don't want to create more in my life that way is um it's not helpful mm -hmm. we have to feel our feelings to move out of them in other words, if we just try to stuff them down, uh, they they will manifest in other ways. Well, they go unhealthy. underground, and they they on the, when one of the central ways in which they show up is as stress, and so we have an internal level of stress that is equal to the level of 
energy it takes to tamp down emotions that we don't want to deal with. And so when we don't have to tamp those emotions down, we're then freer to be healthy and to feel good. And we can't feel good. We can't feel good feelings if we're busy tamping down all the negative ones. And so the negative, we call negative feelings, which are, are actually just feelings. And so, yeah. you know, if, and I even Sadness, find my, anger. You know, slipping into saying negative versus positive. Again, it's, yeah, and, it's, and that's not it's, a, it's a wrong use because wrong use. there are no negative feelings, but there are certainly feelings we don't want to feel. We There's experiences like we don't want to have. And so the talk today is really about how do we create a climate, an emotional climate? How do we create a space for well being? And so, and for manifesting more of what we want. Yeah. So the, the first thing I'd like to suggest is that if you are feeling really great and you're feeling healthy and things are really working for you, this is not a time to step away from prayer and meditation. This is a time to refine those skills. This is a time to really practice. And if you've got nothing wrong with you, which is wonderful, then you can certainly do a gratitude meditation. You can start your meditation and your prayer with how grateful you are for all of the people, all of the energies, all of the spirits, all of the intelligence that's operating in the universe in favor of you, or you wouldn't be here. All the people who didn't come into your lane when you were going down the road and they stayed in their own lane that allowed you to get to where you were going. You can practice gratitude to the point where you actually have changed your emotional state, but you're creating a climate every day for the emotional state that you want to be able to go to and enjoy and appreciate when you don't feel good. Uh, I have this practice that I go through every day and no matter how bad the day is, I spend at least 10 minutes in meditation on gratitude. And that sets the stage for me to feel better in other areas of my life or to, to just stop feeling bad about whatever I was feeling bad about. What I know is that what you're thinking about tends to manifest energetically in one form or another. So when you change the way you're thinking, it isn't to avoid, but you decide to give attention to gratitude or positiveness in some area of your life, then you're comfortable enough. You can say, so what is that suffering? Or what is that pain I'm feeling? What, what, what can, where's the origin of that? What can I do with that? How could I not have that happen any longer? How could I solve that problem? So it, prayer and meditation isn't a way to get away from and avoid. It's a way to create a safe place where you can enter into it and actually make an inquiry. But you need to practice that when you're feeling good so that when you're not feeling good, it's an easier place to go to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because otherwise it can be impossible to go there if you're feeling emotional or physical pain. Well, and we've got some folks right now in our, in our, in our group, in our family here, who uh, are, have gone through extraordinary pain. And, and when you're going through extraordinary pain, it's hard to feel extraordinarily good. It's hard to feel positive. It's hard to feel anything other than, can I even survive the, the next few minutes? And the answer is the universe is in favor of you even when it doesn't appear, doesn't appear to be that way. That healing is our nature. And that's, we need to know that at a, at a very deep level so we can continually go back and say, I know it hurts. I know things are not okay, but I can still do this. I, I can still move forward. I can savor whatever there is that I can. Uh, one of the members of our group has posted some beautiful quotes and uh, about hope and about making an effort to, to live through the pain. And I, I wondered, I thought, wow, I wonder if she would have posted these kinds of things were life going well for her. And I got to thinking, you know, maybe sometimes pain awakens in us a deeper inquiry into our own nature. It opens up questions that we normally just don't have to deal with, but once answered, make us richer. And so there are no bad moments, but there are certainly moments we don't want to have. We don't want to experience, and we will, we have to. Indeed, we have to. And, and when we do, I think we, we don't want to use our teaching to uh, make us feel like we have either done something wrong to cause yeah. this to ourselves or that we are uh, causing more painful things to happen in, in the future. Because um, as, as my first teacher shared, it's not every thought that manifests. And I think even Ernest Holmes says this. It is your tendency yeah. of thought, you know, or the... The, the vast majority of your thinking. Um, and then you add the feeling to that. And that feeling is like the gasoline. Uh, it's like the fuel that yeah. fuels that forward into future manifestation. Uh, but, but I do think that we gain some of our greatest wisdom. We gain some of our greatest uh, 
understanding and, and empathy through our own pain. I, I, I wish we grew as much through the good times <laughs> as we grow from, from our own struggles uh, in becoming um, a better person, a more empathetic person, a kinder person even. You know, when I went into to the army in, in back in the uh, 60s, uh, and the first thing you do is to take off your hair, which for, was real important at that time for me. Now it's not <laughs> so Because you had lots of it. <laughs> lots of it, yeah. They, they <laughs> take your hair, they take your clothes, they take your home. And the sergeant sat in front of us and said, the first sergeant, who was a very, very big man who didn't look anything like anybody I ever knew, he said, I'm your mother, I'm your father, I'm your family, I'm your girlfriend, I'm your boyfriend, whatever you want, that's who I am. And you're not, and, mm -hmm. and, and it, I was devastated. I mean, my whole identity, everything, I'm an artist, no, you're not, not here, you're a soldier, and you can't even march right. And, but what was interesting is through basic training, I began to evolve a sense of, well, who is it I am if I'm not any of these things? And so I hated the experience of having to face that so much of what I called myself was in my hair and in my resume and in the things that I said I could do and where I lived. And all that was taken away and I had to come up with a new identity. I had to identify myself in some new way. So the pain of it forced me to look at deeper questions that I didn't want to look at, but I never had to look at. And so I think that that often happens for us. Like when, who, who am I really? Really, yeah. And I, I knew I wasn't the, a uniform soldier. Uh, that's what I was wearing. But I got when I had to put on the uniform, I began to realize that I had always been wearing the uniform. But since okay. I picked it, I didn't know it, that it was a uniform. See, we often make choices that make us think that we're making choices and that, uh, that, that, and that that's who we are, when in fact, they're often what's trendy or what's right or what's popular right now. And we agree to it and it makes us feel comfortable. So we don't examine the bigger question was who would I be without all of this? And so pain and struggle and illness makes you have to look at that and, and ask yourself, well, who am I really? And, and I don't recommend it, uh, <laughs> but it, no. is, it is how we, how we grow. And so another way of looking at that is that there are no accidental experiences and there are no experiences that don't have value. It's just hard in the middle of any one of these to, to have it have value. I know when I sit in the dentist chair and I hold on to the armrests so that they won't get away from me <laughs> tighter and tighter and the dentist says, you're going to feel a little pressure here, which, which translates into enormous pain that you never thought you'd experience. <laughs> And, and I go through all of that and thinking, I can't, I can't, I can't, I have to, I'll just hold on tight, keep the chair with me. And then a little while later, he says, now you've got a new filling or a crown or whatever you've got and you'll be good to go. I think, wow. So this actually was for my, for my highest good. It was actually, yeah, it just didn't feel that way. And, but I have to endure. I have to be willing to put up with that. Yeah, exactly. And and some of our, our audience are our age. You're kidding. And and we, we have noticed as you get older, <laughs> things change and, and there are more painful events. I just came back from a nine day trip to Spain with my son and his wife. And it was, I saw wonderful things. I saw marvelous things. I saw wonderful uh, flamenco dancers. Oops, it's not showing my flamenco dancers. And and went to the place where they originated in Seville. It, it was marvelous. I learned lots of things. And I managed to, to, to be in pain a lot of the time with blisters on my feet from so much walking or uh, the bicycle ride where I fell on the sidewalk. And then coming home to Miami airport, um, the escalators weren't working, the elevators weren't working. And I was carrying uh, quite a bit of weight on my back in the form of a backpack. And walking down this huge long elevator with like foot escalator, yeah. escalator with foot uh, step, you know, at least one foot high steps, uh, and something in my knee popped, <laughs> and and then hurt <laughs> badly. And I spent most of yesterday you know, just lying around with my leg up. So, you know, this is annoying. <laughs> this is annoying. This has never happened to me before with travels. And I go, yes, and uh, you've never been this age before with travel since. It is so easy at that point to say, well, what did I do to create this? Yes. How did I bring this into manifestation? Yes, yes. Well, you were at the airport. That was one of the things you did. 
And another is that you were tired and hadn't had any sleep. I know, but what did I do to manifest this? And so we're looking. <laughs> we for can some, use that teaching. Yeah, against yeah. So it must like be. Some, I'm flawed somehow. No, you're you're actually over forty now, and uh, and you're carrying close to that amount of weight on your back, and you hadn't slept all night long, and you're yeah. on a nine hour flight. But yeah, okay, what did you do to bring this about? Well, and you were in a hurry to get home to see the most important person in your life humbly submitted by me, of course. Wow, I mean, so when we do that, I can never think of the author's name. Uh, someone, when I, every time I do this, it, somebody types it in for me, which I appreciate. But he, he wrote that you have to do, in order to be a success, you have to put in your 10,000 hours. And the 10,000 hours moves you from, I wanna do this, or I'm trying to do this, to I have mastery over this. And mastery allows whatever it is that you're doing, whatever the tool is you're using, to, to allow you to express you through that tool rather than having the tool be a block or a limitation. That 10,000 hours is really important. That could apply to meditation, it could apply to prayer. For me, it applies as an artist, uh, as a therapist it applies because until you have that, which is why when you graduate from college with a master's degree in counseling, you then have to put in your 10,000 hours. Three years. Yeah, to develop mastery to the point where you're safe to go out in public and practice your practice. And until you're safe, they give you a county job or a city job or something like that, where you could hurt people and it's okay. <laughs> and such. I take that back. This is not being this is being recorded. Oh, yes. I hate that. So, but the ten thousand hours is important. The second thing is how passionate, or in relationship to our talk, how much emotion. What's the emotional body look like, and does it match the the willingness to do the ten thousand hours? So, when you put in the practice. And you have the emotional body for it. You think, yes, I, this is this is a dream come true. Those are two major factors that help manifest what you want to have happen. And in fact, if you were to take up a trade, those would be two of the things that would have to happen. Now, what's the third one? And this is the one that really foiled people: serendipity. <laughs> Sitting on the airplane next to the person who, by the way, is going to hire you by the time you get off the airplane, and you don't know that person, and you sit down in the seat. So serendipity is this this strange equation where somebody knows somebody the best jobs i've ever gotten i got because somebody told me about somebody that i should talk to and i did and they said oh well, you're interested in working for me and i already had a job or you know but wouldn't we call that serendipity the law of attraction oh i think it really is yeah but i but i i afraid that i'm using the the, the the way that it was written in the book but why i like serendipity rather than the law of attraction is that it says it's more a play than just you there's other interactions and, and the law of attraction, of course, is that consciousness attracts consciousness like itself. But the problem with that is that if you don't get what you want very easily or very comfortably, you can say what's wrong with my consciousness, that apparently I'm not, I'm not working hard enough. I, have, I'm not, I must not be doing something right. But what you don't realize is the conditions that are outside of you also have to be working in, in that direction. And, and it may be two, three, four, five steps before you actually get to the position for the thing to come true. So, and another way of saying that, which is very spiritual, is it's complicated. <laughs> and since it's complicated, you need to be easier on yourself when the thing that you're looking to overcome, whether it's a disease or a surgery or getting enough money or a person attracting the right person in your life, you need to stop asking the question, what am I doing wrong? And say to yourself, I'm doing a lot of things right and I'm moving forward. And I can hardly wait, and I'm excited to see what the outcome is going to be that'll be in my favor. I like that. You too. I'm gonna try okay, to. You're good. <laughs> try, it so, yeah, try it sometime. A lot of the things that I talk passionately about are, are things that I go back and think, damn, why don't you do more of that, Bob? What's wrong with you? <laughs> you, on the other hand, do all of these things perfectly, and I'm just talking to a mirror. You know? Exactly. So. so let's close with a prayer. Right. Well, before we close with a prayer, what I want to say is please especially since now that we're on a little iPad, we need your resources. We need, we, we put in our 10,000 hours. Uh, we're passionate about what we do. The serendipity is when we get checks in the mail and people give us the gifts of their income and their flow to be able to help us support this ministry to make it continue to work. We love what we do and we love how you support it. And we're asking you, please do that now. And if you have a question about how to do that, go to our website, cslpalmbeaches.org. And click on the part that says donate. And while you're doing that, start smiling. Because I found that when people click on that and they're smiling, they get more. <laughs> because they get more. And you're getting that from us, you're getting from your own smile. So if you'll do that, and, and I want to affirm with you right here and right now, 
that the gift you give, first off, is a heartfelt, soul-felt, whole human experience of sharing who you are in the most profound and powerful way. And that can ask, that can come through as, as a donation to us, but it also comes through as a donation of consciousness that you contribute to the well-being of yourself and us and everyone around you. So know that however little or however much or however grand, it, it's grander than you suspect. It is bigger than you could even have imagined. The gift of you is a gift that does keep giving. And we say thank you for that gift. And so it is. So it is.